The listening part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you will hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You will have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a healthcare professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a physician talking to a new patient, called Mrs. Delilah. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, I have persistent mild weakness in the left leg and occasional off and on numbness in the left hand. I have shortness of breath often. Do you feel any weakness in your arm? No, doctor, but I am ambulating with a cane. Was there any history of falling down? No, doctor. I had repeat carotid dopplers and further imaging studies shows no further increased stenosis in my left internal carotid artery. Okay. What is your age? 51, doctor. You had any illness and treatments? Yes, I had cerebrovascular accident but got treated. What medications are you taking? Plavix, aspirin, levothyroxine, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, insulin, and simvastatin. Any allergies due to medications? No, doctor. Is there any history of illness of your family members? No, doctor. Well, your blood pressure is 170 over 66, heart rate 66, respiratory rate 16, your weight is 254 pounds, and your temperature is 98. Normal cephalic and atraumatic, no dry mouth, no palpable cervical lymph nodes. Your conjunctiva and sclera were clear. Your cranial nerves show mild decrease in the left nasolabial fold. There is a mild increased tone in the left upper extremity. Deltoid shows 5 over 5. The rest shows full strength. Hip flexion is 5 slash 5 on the left. The rest shows full strength. Reflexes were hypoactive and symmetrical. Your gait is mildly abnormal. No ataxia noted. Wide-based, ambulated with a cane. Status, post-cerebrovascular accident involving the right upper pons extending into the right cerebral pentacle with a mild left hemiparenthesis. Status, post-cerebrovascular accident involving the right upper pons extending into the right cerebral peduncle with a mild left hemiparesis has been clinically stable with mild improvement. For now, continue using antiplatelet therapy and statin therapy to reduce the risk of future strokes. Continue to follow with endocrinology for diabetes and thyroid problems. You must strictly control your blood sugar level, optimizing cholesterol and blood pressure control, regular exercise, and healthy diet. I am planning for surgical intervention for the internal carotid artery. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. What's your problem? Well, I have been facing this problem with respect to tonsils for many years. I have throat pain. Do you feel any difficulty in swallowing? No, doctor, but I have got this habit of snoring loudly. Do you get sleep apnea episodes? No, doctor. Often, I am a mouth breather, especially at night times, doctor. What's your age? Seventeen. I had three bouts of tonsillitis this year. On an average, I get about four bouts of tonsillitis per year. Okay. Have you had any illness, treatments, or surgeries earlier? Yes. I had a cholecystectomy. What medicines are you taking now? Nothing, doctor. Is there any family history of illness? Well, my sister has ear infection. Rest of my family members have history of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. Well, your physical examination results show your pulse is 80 and regular. Temperature is 98.4. Weight is 184 pounds. Your tongue, lip, floor of mouth are noted to be normal. Oropharynx does reveal very large tonsils measuring 3 plus or 4 plus. They were exophytic. Mere examination of the larynx reveals some mild edemia of the larynx. You have enlarged tonsils. You have developed chronic andiotonsillitis with andiotonsillar hypertrophy, upper respiratory tract infection with mild acute laryngitis. You have obesity issue. I would recommend that you go for andinotonsillectomy. The risk may include bleeding, infection, scarring, regrowth of the andiotonsillar tissue. There may be need for further surgery, persistent sore throat, voice changes, etc. This is the end of Part A. Part B. Questions 25 to 30. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse in the emergency department discussing the care of a patient with a doctor. Now read the question. So, who have we got here? This is Adam King. He was brought in with a dislocated shoulder. He has Marfan syndrome, so we've seen him before with this. Last time he was here, the shoulder popped back in while we were putting his arm in a sling and... He was able to put it back in himself just by relaxing his muscles, but he's in quite a bit of pain right now, so he's having trouble calming down and getting those muscles relaxed. Right, I see. So, do you want to start with some nitrous and some pain relief? Yes, I think that's best. Just until he calms down. Question 26. You hear a trainee doctor discussing a patient diagnosis with a tutor. Now read the question. Let's have a quick chat about the diagnosis for Janine in Ward 2. Yeah, I, I was a bit unsure about that one. Um, because it's a young patient, it's quite... It's not going to be diverticulitis, or... Well, it's possible, but she is young, so... Yeah, it's unlikely. So, what do you think? What else could it be? What else happens in the bowel? Something common. Think about common things. Bilateral lower abdominal pain? Uh, because it's, like, radiating into the back? Yeah, something very much, much more common than that. Gastroenterological? Yeah. Um, I can't think. 
possibly related to diet? Celiac disease? Perhaps, but there's not a lot of other symptoms pointing to that. What else would give you discomfort in the bowel? Lower abdominal pain. Mm, I suppose if they're just constipated. Right, yeah, constipation. Question 27. You hear a hospital nurse briefing a colleague about a patient recovering from elective surgery. Now read the question. So, who have we got in bed eight? Bed eight? Uh, Mr. Bernard Chambers, a 50-year-old man. Had an elective bilateral inguinal hernia repair this morning. His wound is covered and dry and his post-operative observations are stable. Temp is 37, his blood pressure 140 on 70. He's already started eating a little and his walking is tolerated. Analgesia is written up but he hasn't needed anything. He's planned for discharge tomorrow. His wife can pick him up. And he'll need a sick certificate for work before he leaves. Can you make sure he gets that please? I asked the ward clerk to copy some post-op information for him, but I haven't had a chance to look through it with him. Question 28. You hear two hospital managers talking about an information session for people who want to do voluntary work. Now read the question. So, how's the planning going for the future volunteer information evening? Well, we've had a lot of RSVPs already, so I'm really happy with the way the event management systems have worked. Having a bit of trouble sourcing some good catering, though. Considering that these people are freely giving their time to come and learn what is expected, I really want to provide some nice food and refreshments for them. Have uh, you got any contacts you like using? Yeah, look, that's right. It's a small thing we can do for those participants. I'll tell you what. I'll ask around my team for some recommendations for something a bit special. Great, thanks. I really appreciate it. You hear a pharmacist talking to a doctor about a patient's medication. Now read the question. Sorry to bother you, Dr. Anderson. I just wanted a quick word about Mrs. Campbell's prescription. The one for diphenhydramine that you gave her last week. Ah, oh, yes, for her allergies. Yeah, so she's been taking 50 milligram tablets for about a week now. The thing is, she's just been into the pharmacy and she says the tablets are making her feel really drowsy and her mouth's really dry ever since she started on the pills. Really? Well, that does happen from time to time. But uh, maybe switching her on to a different medication wouldn't be a bad idea. OK, I'll look into some options and then run them past you later, shall I? Fine, thanks. Question 30. You hear a doctor advising a patient about a change in medication. Now read the question. Now the good news is that I don't think that antibiotics are going to help, so we don't need to think about those. And what I'll be advising actually is, from now, I'll be advising to start with a daily antihistamine. It's called cytirizine. I'll write that down for you because it is cheaper to buy than it is on prescription. And it probably is the number one choice for... I hope you don't mind this bit of scrappy paper that's okay, here. That's okay. The number one choice for hay fever at this stage. This is one tablet a day. Now, for most people, it's absolutely fine. One person in about a hundred gets a bit drowsy with this, so if you find when you've taken this that you get drowsy, then it could be this, and we maybe need to think of other options, and we'll come back to talk about that.
That is the end of part B. Now turn over and look at part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the doctor briefing his staff about the pathology report. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello Doctor, will you please explain to me about the type of information included in a pathology report? Well, often a pathology report of surgical specimens is complex and very long. These are divided into many subheadings. The general information includes the name of the patient, the medical report number, the date of the biopsy or surgery and the unique number of the specimen that is assigned in the lab. The next set of information often contains patient information provided by the doctor who resected the tissue sample. This information includes the special requests made to the pathologist and the medical history. For instance, if a lymph node sample is being resected from a patient with cancer in another organ, the doctor will indicate the type of the original cancer. This is useful in guiding the pathologist's selection of special tests that may be required to assess if any cancer in that lymph node is a metastasis from the original cancer or else a new cancer that started in the lymph node. Gross description is the next part of the information. Here, the term gross means the details seen without using a microscope by simply looking at it and feeling the tissue sample and measuring. In the case of a small biopsy, the gross description would be a few sentences listing its colour, size and consistency. Gross description would also include the number of tissue containing cassettes submitted for biopsy. However, in the case of a larger biopsy or tissue specimen, for instance a mastectomy for breast cancer, this will have lengthy gross descriptions including the size of the entire piece of tissue, size of the cancer tumour, how close the cancer tumour is to the nearest surgical margin of the specimen, how many lymph nodes were detected in the underarm area and the particulars of the non-cancer tissues. A note of where tissue was taken from is also included. The gross description is very short for cryptology specimens. That usually notes the number of smears or slides made by the doctor. If the specimen is a body fluid, its volume and colour are indicated. Microscopic description will include details such as the appearance of cancer cells, how these cells are arranged together and the extent of invasion to the nearby tissue in the specimen. 
Results of any other investigations made, such as flow cryptometry, histochemical, etc., may be indicated in the microscopic description or in an exclusive section. Diagnosis is the most significant part of the pathology report. Although this is the bottom line of the pathology, this section can be mentioned at the top or bottom of the report. The doctor relies on this final diagnosis information to decide on the best treatment methodologies. In case the diagnosis is made for a cancer tumour, this section will indicate the exact type of cancer and will include the grade of cancer. Once the final diagnosis is complete, the pathologist may want to include any additional notes for the doctors taking care of the patient. Often, this comment section is used to recommend further diagnosis or to clarify a concern. Now look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the doctor giving a lecture to the junior doctors on lung carcinoid tumours. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. We all know that cancer begins when the cells begin to grow out of control. Cells in any part of our body can become cancer and can metastasis to other parts. Significantly, lung carcinoid tumours are uncommon and grow slower compared with other types of lung cancers. Lung carcinoids are made up of special cells called neuroendocrine cells. Before we try to understand lung carcinoid tumours, it is essential to know something about the structure and functionings of the lungs, as well as the neuroendocrine system. Our right lung has three sections called lobes and our left lung has two lobes. The left lung is smaller because the heart takes up room on that side. When we breathe in, air goes into the lungs through the trachea. The trachea divides into tubes called the bronchi that enter the lungs and further divide into smaller branches called the bronchioles. At the end of the bronchioles, there are tiny air sacs called alveoli, from where many tiny blood vessels run through. These blood vessels absorb oxygen into the bloodstream and pass carbon dioxide into the alveoli, which is exhaled. Therefore, the main function of the lungs are inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. A thin lining, known as the fulra, surrounds the lungs, which protects the lungs and helps them slide back and forth as they expand and contract while we breathe. Fulra capacity is the space inside our chest that contains the lungs. A dome-shaped thin muscle called the diaphragm below the lungs which separates the chest from the abdomen. Therefore, while we breathe, the diaphragm moves up and down, forcing the air in and out of the lungs. Lung carcinoid tumours develop from the cells of the diffuse neuroendocrine system. 
made up of the cells that are similar to nerve cells and hormone-making endocrine cells. These cells do not form an actual organ like the thyroid or adrenal glands. Instead, these cells are scattered throughout the body in organs such as the intestines, stomach and lungs. Neuroendocrine cells secrete hormones such as adrenaline and similar substances. This may help control airflow and blood flow in the lungs and may help control the growth of other types of lung cells. Neuroendocrine cells may detect the oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the air we breathe and then discharge chemical messages to help the lungs adjust accordingly. For instance, people living at higher altitudes will have more lung neuroendocrine cells because of the decreased oxygen level in the air they breathe. At times, lung neuroendocrine cells undergo certain changes causing them to grow big and form tumours. These are known as neuroendocrine cancers. Lung carcinoid tumours are a kind of neuroendocrine tumour. However, neuroendocrine tumours can form in any part of our body. Stomach is another common site for neuroendocrine tumour formation. There are four different types of neuroendocrine lung tumours. Starting with the aggressive growth of the cancer, the four types are small cell lung cancer, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, atypical carcinoid tumour and typical carcinoid tumour. Small cell lung cancer is one of the aggressively growing and spreading tumours. Large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is a rare type of cancer. It is a subcategory of non-small cell lung cancer, though it grows aggressively like small cell lung cancer. Typical and atypical carcinoid tumours are carcinoids that appear different under the microscope. Typical carcinoids grow slowly and they rarely spread beyond the lungs. 90% of the lung carcinoids are typical carcinoids. Atypical carcinoids grow a little faster and they are likely to spread to other organs. They contain more cells in the process of dividing and they appear more like a fast-growing tumour. Unlike the typical carcinoids, atypical carcinoids are uncommon. At times, carcinoids are classified by where they develop from inside the lung. Central carcinoids form in the bronchial walls near the centre of the lungs and most lung carcinoid tumours are central carcinoids, which are also typical carcinoids. Peripheral carcinoids form in the bronchioles towards the outer edges of the lungs.